present our next keynote, uh, or introduce rather our next keynote. Uh, Crane Hasselt is a former FBI and is now the Senior Director of Threat Research at Agari. Um, so without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Crane Hasselt. All right, thank you. I'm super excited to be here. I'm very excited about this presentation. I was telling Paul and TJ earlier, this might be uh, one of my favorite presentations I've gotten to review, and you'll see here in a little bit why that is. I think it's going to generate some awesome discussion. Um, as you can see, sort of the purpose of this presentation is going to be looking at malware analysis, how we use it today, um, sort of seeing what the output is, and seeing how we can make it better. Um, let me get just an idea of how many people here are malware analysts, are very interested in malware analysis or reverse engineers? How many people in the room? A good number, okay. I will give you a trigger warning for those of you who do that. The first quarter of this presentation, you may have some issues with. Uh, and you'll see why here in just a second. Um, but don't worry, this is sort of a, we're gonna go on a journey together. We're gonna talk about malware analysis and how we can improve it. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, we can all sort of come to an understanding of you know, when we talk about malware analysis and how we report it to people, how we can make it more effective. So let's start that journey. So as, a, as an industry, as a community, we do a lot of reporting about malware, right? I'll tell you, each one of these titles on this page, I believe, came from a different company or a different vendor. Um, and you can see that's mostly, if you look at the past couple years, we've seen a lot of ransomware reporting, a lot of reporting about things like banking trojans. And when we look at these blogs or other types of articles, usually this is what they contain. They're very technical in nature. They contain, you know, we'll look through, you know, binary ex uh, execution analysis, look at some of the source code in depth, some shell code, look at what files or keys are created, as well as an in-depth look at some of the, the functions and processes and strings of the malware itself. Um, there's a lot of articles out there that go through uh, disassembly and debugging, right? Walking through those types of things, looking at you know, what network behavior can we see? What specific IOCs come out of these samples we're, we're analyzing? And what are some of the defensive mechanisms there, right? So this is where some of you that are malware analysts now may be like, what the hell is this guy talking about? So I've just gone over what all of these reports look like, how we you know, report this type of malware. I'm gonna ask you this. So what? What does this mean? Why do we do this? Why is this relevant to anyone, really? So when you look at a lot of the malware reports that come out, the general public can't understand most of it. Most people who are the intended audience of these reports, of these articles, really couldn't get through the first couple sentences before they completely tune out because they don't understand it. And really, the purpose of external reporting, why we're publishing something, is to help a specific audience inform them about certain threats so they can protect themselves from the threats. And if they can't understand it, then why should they care? When you think about cyber attacks these days, for the most part, the technical components of these attacks are secondary concerns. It's what happens after someone has already clicked a button. And really, the, what we should be concerned about, number one, is preventing the delivery of these threats before the malicious technical components of it are even a problem. And really, that infection vector, when you look at the infection vector, is usually very non-technical. Generally, it's going to be social engineering. Generally, it's going to be phishing. And when you talk about cyber type things, that's not very cybery. It's really just behavioral exploitation and nothing more. The technical concepts of cyber attacks happen after the fact. Also, what people are interested in, except, especially when you look at businesses and, and uh, inter enterprises, what the decision makers at those places are actually worried about and actually care about are what's the impact? If someone does click a button and one of these, uh, these pieces of malware does go off in my environment, 
What's the actual impact there? How much money is it going to cost me? How much time offline is there going to be that I'm not going to have access to data? Is anything going to be getting, being taken from my environment? And what does my brand, from like a brand reputation perspective, how does it hurt my brand? So when we're talking about malware and why we care about malware, it's not the malware itself really, it's before and after the malware actually goes off. So when we think about what's the purpose of these reports, and we'll talk about this more as we go through this presentation, but what's the purpose of these, these reports should be to inform our audience about these types of things. How to prevent an actual attack from happening and how through the analysis of malware we can prevent that. And then also in the event that it does go off and it does enter my environment, what's actually going to happen? Why should I care after the fact? So I invite you guys to think about a bank robbery, right? Think about someone going into a bank and robbing it. Could be a picture like this. I'll tell you that looking for actual images of a bank robbery on Google Images is actually quite difficult. This is the best one I could find. But and it's still even not that good. But take this guy, right? He's gone into a bank. He's wearing this hoodie and a jacket, sunglasses, sort of bandana over his, over his mouth, and he's got a handgun, right? And so this is sort of like generic what you might think of when you think of a bank robbery. And I want to make this sort of analogy to what we do in malware analysis. This is the attack, right? This is the attack. This is what has actually happened. In malware analysis, what we do is we go hyper-focused on the weapon that was used to rob the bank, right? If this was a cyber attack and a lot of the malware reporting we see out there, we would go into great detail about what type of gun was this? What were the detailed components of this gun? How did it function? What was the result if once it went off, if it went off? But we don't care about anything else outside of that gun. We don't care about who, who, was, who was holding the gun. We don't care about the environment that he was in when he came into the bank. All of those types of things. So when you think about a bank robbery, when someone's investigating a bank robbery, do the investigators really care about the intricate details about the weapon that was used to rob the bank? No. No, they don't. They care about the context around the actual attack. They care about what was actually going to happening outside of that perspective. What they really want to know are things like who robbed the bank? What was the robber wearing? When was the bank robbed? Why did the robber choose this specific bank? What defensive, defenses, if any, did the robber have to overcome in order to enter the bank to rob it? How was the robber behaving during the robbery? Was he nervous? Was he sort of practiced? Have there been any other similar robberies in the area? And how much money was stolen? And when you think about sort of a, a general description of this from an intelligence perspective, sort of this is really what we want to know when we're talking about a bank robbery. Attribution, a general description of the threat, the temporal indicators around, uh, around the attack itself, the motivation of the attacker, how much preparation was needed by the attacker to commit this crime, uh, the sophistication of the attacker, uh, any types of case linkages, and ultimately the impact. How much impact did, did, did this attack actually have? And so I ask you this. Why is this what investigators of bank robberies actually care about? Because at the end of the day, what they want to do is to prevent this from happening, is identify the person behind the, behind, uh, the robbery, and put them to justice. So now we'll move on to this and we'll talk about cyber threat intelligence because this is really where we're moving in this discussion. And so I took this, uh, this quote is from, from iSight Partners, probably one of the, the best sort of condensed descriptions of cyber threat intelligence that I've seen and we'll walk through this. So 
based on what, uh, what Eyesight Partner says in this quote is, cyber threat intelligence is knowledge about adversaries. We'll stop there. So essentially, we want to know who is targeting us. We want to know who is attacking us. So cyber threat intelligence is, no is knowledge about adversaries and their motivations, intentions, and methods. Essentially, the how and the why something is occurring that is collected, analyzed, and disseminated. So one of the things about cyber threat intelligence that I think most, sort of, most people out there have a misrepresentation of is that when we're talking about things like IOCs, right, data, that they call that intelligence. But really what intelligence is, is looking at that data, looking at those IOCs, interpreting it, and coming up with an analysis and a good, uh, some good recommendations out of that interpretation. In ways that help security and business staff at all levels, so I want to point that out because this means that not only is your SOC or your threat intel team supposed to be aware and is able to be sort of read the recommendations of the reports that come out, but also C-level folks, executives, people that don't have an in-depth understanding of this but need to know the problem. To protect the critical assets of the enterprise. At the end of the day, the purpose of this, the purpose of what we do is to try to proactively make it that a, an attack does not happen, right? So to sum it up, to sum up this description of cyber threat intelligence, what is it? So it's actor-centric. We, we want to know more about the why and the how. Why is something happening? How is it happening? It's more than just raw data, right? It's an interpretation, an analysis of that data. It's consumable by everyone and not just a small subset of technical people. And it's used for proactive defense. And so one of the issues out there is that you have intelligence analysis and malware analysis. You have intelligence analysts and malware analysts. And one of the things that I've found is that the ways of thinking of these two groups are diametrically opposed to one another. The way that intelligence analysts think about a problem versus the way that malware analysts think about a problem is generally very different. Intelligence analysts usually look at, look at something from a macro level. They want to look at the high level understanding of, of a problem and understanding what it means. Whereas malware analysts, in my experience, usually take a very micro look at a problem. They want to dig in to a single thing and understand what that thing means and what it does. And I think part of this is not, and there's not anything wrong with this, but I think a lot of this has to do with training and how each of these two groups are trained to think, right? For, from a malware analyst's perspective, that is what you are supposed to do. You are supposed to understand what a single piece of malware does, how it behaves, and, and, and what the output of that is. An intelligence analyst is, is trained to look at the big picture, to understand the why and the how of a problem, and to not look into the weeds of any specific artifact. And both of these sort of groups and training of these groups have been around for a very long time. And it was, only it was only once sort of cyber became a problem that they sort of had to coexist with one another. And that is sort of what we're in the middle of right now, is trying to get these two groups that have historically done different things to think similarly to one another. And it's not just malware analysts thinking like intelligence analysts, but it's also intelligence analysts thinking like malware analysts, right? And so, so we have this conflict of how uh, these, different, these two groups think. So let's talk about malware analysis. And we'll talk about how we can turn malware analysis into malware intelligence analysis. And really, these are the three things that I think when you're thinking about malware, if you're analyzing malware, what you should be thinking about the so what aspect of it. So the first part is prepare. 
preparation. What do I need to know to protect my users or someone else's users from this threat? What is the initial infection vector, right? How does it get into my environment potentially? And what do I need to look out? What, what do I need to look out for to make sure that doesn't happen? That I can proactively detect it before someone actually receives it. What is my risk level for a certain type of threat? When we're talking about threat actors and we're talking about their motivations, right? Motivation is very important if you are a, uh, if you're a company because if I know that group A is motivated by whatever, but my company doesn't do that or probably doesn't do that, the risk level for that group that that group poses for my business is minimal. But if group B is a primarily financially motivated group and I'm a bank, then I might see them as a higher risk level. So when I'm trying to prepare and prioritize threats targeting my organization, motivation is a very important aspect of that. What security holes do I need to close? So the biggest, so the biggest, uh, the biggest example of this, I, I don't know if any of you have heard of WannaCry. Show of hands, no? Yeah, okay. So that was kind of a big deal, right? But how easy was WannaCry technically to prevent? Super, super easy, right? There was one exploit that it used that came from you know, the NSA tool dump. And all companies had to do was to patch that hole. And their risk level for WannaCry, and later, you know, not pet yet, was almost zero. So what security holes do I need to close? What types of suspicious behaviors should I block or alert? So when I'm looking at malware, right, if, if you're doing malware analysis and you're looking at the behavior of that, I don't need to know in the weeds specifically what the code looks like to create this, this certain behaviors. I just need to know what the behavior is and what the audience that I'm reporting to would need to know in order to implement protections against that behavior. And then we also talked about prioritization as well. So preparation from a malware intelligence analysis perspective is number one. Number two, if something does enter my environment, if one of my users does click on something that causes this malware to explode, essentially, in my environment virtually, what do I need to know to quickly remediate this type of attack? What pwned me, essentially? What is it? What artifacts should I be looking for to help me clean this up? How do I contain the threat quickly without infecting other users? What's the business impact? Again, we go back to what's the financial impact? What is the uh, exposure impact from, uh, from this malware? Think, go back again to think about uh, last year and the, and the ransomware issues with, with uh, WannaCry and, and NotPetya. Think about Maersk, right? Maersk was one of the big victims of, uh, of WannaCry. Not Petya. One of the other. yeah, not Petya. Think about them. Not just from a financial perspective, in the hundreds of millions of dollars that that caused, but also from the corporate exposure perspective. What the reputation of Maersk looks like after that happened. And then, sort of that this merges into the next category. But what evidence can I collect while I'm doing incident response? that can be used in the investigation to hopefully identify who these guys are behind the scenes. So investigate, right? So what do I know about the actor or group behind this attack? So not just the, the what pwned me, but who? Who was it actually? Can this actor be linked to other attacks? So that case linkage aspect that we talked about with the bank robberies. How do we fully mitigate this threat? And what I mean by fully is 
how do I take the person responsible for an attack and take them offline? Because you can mitigate an attack technically, but it's not going to stop, right? It's not going to stop until the person behind that attack is motivated to stop. So how do you do that? And then, and this really gets into the reporting aspect of malware analysis, but what actionable intelligence can I provide to others so this doesn't impact them? And so we have prepare, respond, and investigate. And really what we have here at the end of the day is sort of a modified intelligence cycle, right? So you have, and it all sort of flows into one another. You have the preparation, that then if you, once you prepare and something does happen, then you can respond to it. Once the IR process, if you're responding to it, then you're investigating after the fact. You're collecting evidence to investigate. And then you have the reporting aspect of it. And this is really where, so I added report here because this is where, when we talked about the very beginning of this presentation, this is where it really comes into play. If my reporting only focuses on the in-depth technical artifacts that I see from a threat, then the preparation side of it doesn't benefit. It doesn't benefit at all because I'm not giving the audience anything that will help them prepare. There may be a little bit of, uh, a little bit of information that will help me from an incident response perspective. If you're talking about you know, what files are being dropped, these things like that. But from a preparation perspective, which is really what we should be doing overall, it doesn't really help me. So I want to talk about a, a couple of examples here to sort of discuss this a little bit further. So ransomware, right? It's a problem. I ask you again, so what? So what? So what about ransomware? So if you think about a couple, a couple years ago, ransomware has kind of been a thing a little bit lately. In 2016, I'm sure most of you know, sort of ransomware blew up, especially from a media perspective. I love this chart from, from F-Secure. It gives a great visual representation of what the hell actually happened. In 2016, almost 200 different variants and families of ransomware were identified. And you better believe most of those were reported in some sort of blog by different vendors. And really, most of these families they were around for, what, a couple of days, a week maybe? There was really a small handful of families of ransomware that really persisted throughout 2016 and still persist today. And so when you look at the intelligence aspect of ransomware, we'll go back to the three things we were looking at before, prevention, response, and investigation. Really with ransomware, prevention is key. So if I'm communicating to an audience about what I should care about with ransomware, prevention should be the number one thing, right? The, the biggest recommendation for, for ransomware is backups, right? Everyone should back up their stuff. Well, there are some variants of ransomware that infiltrate backups as well. And from an awareness perspective, from an intelligence perspective, that is extremely important. What are some signatures that I can look at for when it is coming into my environment? Again, we're looking at, generally, generally speaking, phishing emails for the most part. What do those phishing emails look like? What signatures can I build off of that so my inbound protections can detect them? And then the behavioral indicators of ransomware. What type of behavior does this type of ransomware exhibit if it has been clicked on, what can I look for? I'm not talking about threat data. I'm not talking about IOCs or anything like that. I'm not, I don't care about the hash. I don't care. I want to know what kind of behavior is being exhibited to prevent an infection. The incident response side of it. Really, this is what people care about if they're ever infected with ransomware. How do I get access to my files back? That's all they care about, right? And, they, and if you're an enterprise, if you're a, uh, a business, all you really want to do is minimize and assess the damage of this attack. So when you think about what happened a couple of years ago, 
in the second half of 2016, when the big groups started targeting businesses, healthcare, hospitals, things like that, the reason they did this is because they knew that the value of data to those companies was extremely high, that they needed access to data constantly. And if they didn't have access to it, they would be more likely to pay, right? And so from a response perspective, how do I minimize that damage if possible? From an investigation perspective, after the fact, so we can do, uh, you know, we can look at malware and understand how it ties together and see if there's any ransomware that's associated with any other uh, uh, families of ransomware. But really from an investigation perspective, how do we get to the who behind the scenes? One of the most useful ways of doing this is cryptocurrency wallet analysis, targeting targeting wallets, uh, tying wallets together and trying to identify the characteristics with that. So the so what aspect of ransomware is essentially this type of stuff. This is what we really care about and what we really should be reporting about when we're talking about ransomware. So the next one I want to talk about here, banking Trojans. So what? So what? Who cares about banking Trojans? And some people here in the room, and I've had very detailed discussions about banking Trojans and my thoughts about them, but really when you think about banking Trojans, it is very challenging to actually care about them. The challenge with them is that for the most part, they target non-technical individual users on their home computers or mobile phones. Right? So prevention, you know, we talked about prevention. This is what we should, we, be, should, we should be reporting. But prevention essentially relies on antivirus on desktop machines and app store controls for mobile devices. That's essentially how you prevent banking trojans. And unless you're in one of those industries, if you're, if you're in the AV industry or you're Google, essentially, then prevention is very difficult, or you really not care about prevention. We always talk about security awareness training and how great that is and how that you can inform users about how to look for specific threats, phishing emails coming in. But educating individual users is almost impossible. You're not going to be able to educate that 65-year-old grandma in, in Iowa because she probably won't take the time to look into any of that. And if she does, she's going to, even from a high level, not understand what you're talking about. So at scale, you can't educate individual users. Incident response from the respond acts aspect of this is not possible because you're not in a closed environment. You're not in an environment that you, that you can control you're in individual devices owned by individual people. And so you can't do incident response on those infected machines. And then infrastructure mitigation. So taking down, if you were actioning the actual C2 infrastructure for a banking Trojan, it sounds really good, but at the end of the day, does it actually have an impact if you're someone like TrickBot that has access to likely hundreds of thousands of different IPs that they can use if one gets taken down, does that have any, in, any impact? I would argue it probably doesn't. So how do we actually handle this problem of banking Trojans when we're reporting information about banking Trojans, what should we actually care about? Well, there are two things here. One, I believe that the problem of banking Trojans is primarily a law enforcement issue. There's so little that we can do to actually control and prevent and respond to these things that they will not be mitigated until the people behind them are mitigated. You'll see that happened a little bit with Dyer, right? When Dyer went offline a couple of years ago, 
they were taken down, their activity was taken down, until TrickBot came back. And likely some of the group members from Dyer moved over to TrickBot. There was a lull in activity, but now there's TrickBot. The interesting thing about banking Trojans is that there are relatively, there's a relatively small number of them on both the desktop and mobile side that actually make an impact to the overall threat ecosystem, right? I would say that on, the, on desktop, there are probably five to seven actual families run by a group that actually makes the dent that, is the, that makes up the predominant threat within the banking Trojan threat landscape. On mobile, it's growing, but it's essentially the same thing, is that you have a small number of families that are run by individual groups that make the impact. And the only way to get that, to, to minimize and limit that impact is to take the group out of the equation. Until you do that, they're not gonna stop and there's very little way to actually prevent that. I would say the other thing from an intelligence perspective, what we care about and what we could report to people to try to minimize the impact is the behavior of the malware, right? The behavior of the malware. What if, so since, since you can't control individual users' devices and you can't, unless, you're, unless you have AV on those machines, what you could do is look at the behavior of the malware and, if it's applicable, how that infected host interacts with something like a bank network. And identifying that signature so the, the bank, at the end of the day, the person will probably still get infected, but at least the person who's losing the money, which is the bank, can protect themselves. We were also, Vitaly and I were also talking about earlier, sort of, you know, the evolution of banking Trojans and how eventually banking Trojans, that term may not even be applicable because what is, is happening, and I think is probably from a threat actor's perspective, probably the way that I would go, is that they're moving sort of some slowly away from banks and individual users and targeting organizations and businesses with the same tactics that they use uh, with, a, with a banking Trojan on a, uh, on a bank's website, but targeting organizations, really acting more like a rat than a banking Trojan. That type of behavior, that evolution, that, that evolution of threat is extremely important for someone to understand how a threat is evolving over time. So when we talk about the so what of banking Trojans, why I should care, and when I'm reporting information about banking Trojans, these are the types of things that I should focus on. So sort of to sum up, to wrap up here, you know, we've gone from looking at malware analysis in a bubble, looking at a single piece of malware, and sort of extrapolated that, taking this journey to how we can evolve our thinking for malware analysis to a malware intelligence analysis. And a lot of this has to do with how we report our findings about whatever we're analyzing. And so really communicating the so what. Why should someone care about what I'm reporting makes malware analysis much more valuable. I say don't state the problem, solve the problem. Tell me how I can solve this problem based on what you're showing me. If I'm just stating this is malware X and this is what it does, I'm sure it's interesting. I'm sure from a marketing perspective, it's great, right? But why does that actually matter? Why does that actually matter to someone who's reading it? What we wanna do is try to impact the problem as much as we can and give other people the information that they can impact that problem. Keep thinking of the bigger picture when you're analyzing malware. Don't just look at a piece of malware in a vacuum. Think about how it connects to the overall threat landscape and why it does that. 
and who's behind the scenes. And then also know your audience. Know who you're trying to communicate to, right? And how they're going to use this information. Don't just assume that you're reporting to other malware analysts or reverse engineers. Assume that you're reporting to C-level executives or CISOs that actually have control and a, an intense interest in protecting against the threats you're reporting about. So know your audience. And so the title of my presentation was Taking the Red Pill, and you're probably, most of you are like, where the hell's the matrix references, right? We've, we've, we've gone through this entire presentation and there hasn't been a single matrix reference. I give you this. On the right, you have malware analyst Neo, who's just sitting at his desk, he's taken the blue pill, He's gone back to his day job. He hasn't opened his mind. And then on the left, we have malware intelligence analyst Neo, who has taken the red pill. And by opening his mind, by thinking of the bigger picture, he's now able to do things like this. He's able to stop bullets. It's amazing. So I want you to be able to stop bullets. I want you to think about the bigger picture. So that's all I've got for you today. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there, so there are a lot of great templates out there. So the MITRE ATT&CK uh, attack, uh, uh, template uh, is one of the best ones out there. Um, there's a lot of different, uh, not templates, but sort of analytical thinking methodologies that are out there that will, won't be a template for reporting, but will allow you to think about things in, uh, in, a, um, in a more analytical way. Um, so things, things that, uh, that I always, uh, that I always talk about are things like, even like report, the way that you report as in like uh, bottom line upfront, right? the bluff method, where you are putting what's actually important at the beginning of any type of report. So whoever's reading it will be like, why does this matter to me? So what? They'll know it. They don't have to read the whole thing. They can if they want to. But at least you're doing two things there. You're forcing yourself to think about the so what of your reporting, but you're also giving them what they need to know right at the, front, right at the, right at the top. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, when you talk about the reporting phase of the cycle, um, does, that, does that mean documentation with, and sharing within, say, a security organization and, and uh, maybe a client or the threat intelligence community in general? Does, does that also include relevant law enforcement mm -hmm. authorities? Yeah, so it, so it really depends on what you're looking at. So what, when I talk about report, I'm, re I'm talking about reporting to whoever is appropriate for that type of analysis. It could be simply just internal. It could be when you're doing like incident response. It could just be an internal, uh, internal report to your incident response team and your CISO to let them know the so what aspect of what you found. It could be uh, sharing and reporting externally from a marketing perspective in blogs and articles and things like that. It could be sharing to like trusted partner working groups. And it could absolutely also be uh, for uh, for law enforcement purposes as well. And if you think about it, the context and what you actually want to report to each one of those groups is different. And so when I talk about know your audience, it sort of goes into that as well. So you want to know what's going to be important for each one of those groups. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, with regards to bank security, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm a pra I'm practical, I'm a realist. I understand that a lot of this reporting is for marketing use, right? And it's not really for operational use. And I think that, you know, that's great and all, but I think that we need to, you know, both us as security professionals and sort of our marketing teams need to get into the mindset that we need to understand why we're reporting stuff out there. So yeah, there's absolutely a marketing and journalism aspect of that to get someone's name out to say look how much I know about a certain subject absolutely 
Um, but I think that we need to sort of do better than that. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.